Ease of eating, really, I would have thought. That's one reason. So that you could eat and smile. I would say it's cosmetic reasons, because they look better. Yeah. And also for health reasons, because they actually work better. Well, I mean, they use them for little jobs like biting cotton off and things like that, yeah. but uh, I would say chewing me food, yes. For eating food and keep myself smart. When we ask our patients their most important reason for keeping their natural teeth, occlusion is a top priority. Yet my undergraduate experience of occlusion was one of fear and mystique. It was a subject belonged to the godly realms, beyond my understanding. It even had its own language, occlusive speak. For example, the non-working condyle path is more medial to the protrusive condyle path. Its curvature in the sagittal plane is similar and its inclination to the horizontal is usually the same or slightly steeper than the protrusive condylar path. The non-working condylar path inclination is measured relative to the degree of inclination to the horizontal plane as viewed from the sagittal. Frightening stuff indeed. Many dentists are intimidated by the subject of occlusion. It is usually linked with temporomandibular joint dysfunction syndrome and we switch off at the mere mention of it. But we cannot help but be interested in occlusion. We already know a lot about the subject even if we don't realize it. In order to get our crowns, fillings and dentures in the mouth, we have no choice but to be interested. But do we force our dentistry into the mouth in a negative, uncontrolled way, or do we plan it carefully? If we think of the teeth in function, what can be nicer than a full complement of mandibular teeth closing up to meet a full maxillary arch in balance and harmony? How pathetic is the sight of over-erupted or twisted molars searching for something to bite on, oozing out of their sockets, often carrying the alveolar bone with them, desperate for a playmate. So whether we like it or not, right from the very first moment we alter the occlusal surface of a tooth, we are involved in the subject of occlusion. So what guidelines do we need to follow in our restorative dentistry? If we consider a nutcracker as a model representing the masticatory system, we have the temporomandibular joint, the plane of the maxillary teeth, the plane of the mandibular teeth, and the powerful masticatory muscles acting close to the fulcrum. If we wish to crack a nut, we will place it back towards the fulcrum and apply pressure vertically along the long axis of the teeth, which, with their large occlusal surfaces and root surface areas, are well designed to withstand load along their long axis. If we move the same nut forward to the anterior region, far less load can be applied as we move further away from the fulcrum, placing the anterior teeth in an ideal position to cope with anti-axial forces, for example, lateral and protrusive forces, thus ideally placed to protect the back teeth. So, in a healthy mouth, with teeth erupted into good occlusion, we find axial load directed on all teeth, and as soon as the mandible moves laterally or into protrusion, the force is taken by the canines or incisors. Less frequently, the load is shared in lateral movement by the back teeth to provide group function. So surely then, it is reasonable that as restorative dentists, we try to fit our restorative work into the mouth in such a manner that it will contribute to the health of the whole masticatory system rather than detracting from it. If we accept these principles, then from the very first time we carve an occlusal amalgam, we must be aware of carving the filling into occlusion, providing centric stops, directing forces along the long axis of the tooth, no heavier or no lighter than the teeth on either side, and we must ensure that there are no unplanned anti-axial forces directed on the tooth. When we provide crowns on the upper anterior teeth, we must ensure that the load on the crowns is not in excess of the load on the adjacent teeth in the intercostal position, and that the protrusive and lateral movements are planned in harmony with the rest of the anterior teeth. Before we commence our restorative procedure, we need to first observe the quality of the contacts that already exist on the tooth to be restored, Second, decide whether to accept them or not. And third, decide which contacts we intend to end up with after our procedure. By learning these principles on the very first restoration we ever do, we simply extend these principles to the increasing complexity of our work.
This methodical approach to our work makes our dentistry much more interesting and it ensures its survival for a much longer time. But most important of all, our patients can appreciate the quality of our efforts and enjoy a better standard of dental care as a result. What we need then in general practice is an initial occlusal examination which will sound the warning bells about an occlusal problem and thus encourage us to look further. Indeed, in much the same way as the brief periodontal examination does using the CPITN probe for periodontal disease. In our practice, this initial examination is in three parts. The patient is asked about symptoms, for example, headaches, neck ache, ear ache, facial pain, clenching, grinding habits, awareness of wear of the teeth. The temporalis muscle is palpated in the more tendinous region just above the zygomatic arch and in the posterior aspect of the temporal fossa. Any tenderness is noted. The patient is then asked to open the mouth wide while the dentist palpates the areas around the joints and any tenderness is noted. Any clicking or crepitus in the joint areas or deviation on opening is noted. Finally, the degree of opening is observed and any limitation noted. Both lateral pterygoids are palpated by using the index finger placed distal, lateral and superior to the upper third molar or in this region if the tooth is absent. Any tenderness can readily be observed by the partial closure of the eye. The chairside assistant then drives the teeth and red GHM tape held in a Miller's forceps is placed between the teeth while the patient closes into intercostal position. All centric stops are now clearly marked red. The teeth are again dried and now green GHM tape is held between the teeth while the patient makes excursive movements of the mandible. Both lateral and protrusive movements need to be observed. At this point, any obvious interferences demand close examination particularly on any teeth which are liable to require restorative procedures. Equally, if the teeth requiring restorative procedures are involved in excursive movements, great care will need to be taken to maintain or improve the quality of these movements or to change them in a planned and controlled manner. Using the bilateral manipulation technique as described by Dawson, the mandible is then manipulated into centric relation or the terminal hinge axis and arced to meet the maxilla in the retruded contact position. The retruded contact position is confirmed using shimstock foil held in a hemostat forceps. The quality of the slide from retruded contact position to intercuspal position, both in terms of direction and magnitude, is observed. This completes our initial occlusal examination, which in the case of the vast majority of our patients requires no more than a few minutes. Centric relation is the relationship of the mandible to the maxilla when the condyles are fully seated in their fossae. In this position, the condyles are braced by ligament and bone. For 90% of the population, when the mandible is manipulated into centric relation and the teeth are brought together, centric relation contact position, also known as retruded contact position, is not the same as the intercuspal position. The patient has to slide forward past the interferences of the teeth 
in order to get the teeth maximally meshed together. This means that the condyles are no longer fully seated in their fossae when the teeth are in the intercuspal position. If 90% of the population has retruded contact position distal to intercuspal position, why then do we bother to observe it? Centric relation is relatively reproducible in the absence of muscular inflammation and so provides us with a reference point which may be very important in our restorative procedures. If the slide from retruded contact position to intercuspal position is quite large, then the degree of adaptation of the mandible to the occlusion can be assessed. If the morphology of the teeth which form retruded contact position is to be altered due to our restorative procedures, we need to realize that we are creating the potential for movement of the condyles in their fossae. For example, here the retruded contact position is on upper left seven. If we were to crown this tooth and in so doing alter the morphology, eliminating the interference, the mandible no longer has to adapt by downward and forward movement of the condyles to get past the interference. We have created the potential for movement of the condyles, which may result in our crown being high. Clinically, this leads to much heartache and really a waste of time. It must be remembered that the best set of study models and articulator is the patient's own mouth. After all, it is in the patient's mouth that our restorative procedures ultimately have to perform. However, study models can be a great asset to treatment planning and patient education. Study models mounted in centric relation on a semi-adjustable articulator, which allows excursive movements of the mandibular cast, are much more meaningful than handheld casts. Use of a plain line articulator is not to be recommended because the arc of closure is nothing like that of the mandible to the maxilla and excursive movements of the mandibular casts cannot be made. The face bow record allows us to mount the upper cast in the same spatial relationship to the condylar elements of the articulator as exists between the plane of the maxillary teeth and the condyles in the patient. It consists of a bite fork, a transfer jig, and the slidomatic face bow. Warmed dental wax is molded to the bite fork until four thicknesses of wax are on the upper side. The bite fork is then carefully placed against the occlusal surfaces of the upper teeth, ensuring that the center line of the bite fork matches the patient's center line. It is very important that the wax is not penetrated through to metal as this could give rise to distortion when mounting the cast. Using the DNR reference plane locator located against the distal incisal of the upper right lateral incisor, a mark is made at the tip of the locator when it is lined up with the inner canthus of the eye. The bite fork is then located on the maxillary teeth and stabilized to prevent any movement, in this case using a rubber block, but a piece of wax or cotton wool may also be used. The transfer jig is first located on the face bow, then on the protruding arm of the bite fork. With the aid of the chairside assistant, the ear plugs of the face bow are located in the external auditory meatus on both sides. The face bow reference plane marker is lined up with the mark made using the reference plane locator.
The uppermost screw on the face bow may then be tightened and the intercondylar distance measured if required. The screw marked 1 on the transfer jig is now tightened securely, followed by the screw marked 2. Here we have a closer look at the screws marked 1 and 2 and the face bow reference plane marker. We can now loosen the uppermost screw and remove the face bow and transfer jig assembly from the patient's mouth. The transfer jig can now be released from the face bow and is ready to transfer to the articulator. Blue Mousse is a vinyl polysiloxane material which provides virtually no resistance to movement yet sets to 80% of the hardness of dental plaster in two minutes. In order to record centrigulation, a small piece of toughened Moico Beauty Wax is molded over the upper incisors and the mandible is manipulated into centrigulation and arced towards the maxilla to a point just short of the retruded contact position. There must be no tooth contact. Using a gun delivery system and automix cartridges, blue mousse is introduced onto the occlusal surfaces of the mandibular teeth and the mandible is again manipulated into centriculation and arced into contact with the wax as before. This position is then maintained for two minutes. The blue mousse can then be removed and is ready for transfer to the casts. Here we see the excellent adaptation of the blue mousse to both casts. We now have all the information we require to mount the casts on the articulator in centric relation. The incisal table of the articulator is removed and replaced with the DNR index. The transfer jig locates accurately into the DNR index and is securely tightened. The upper surface of the upper cast is scraped to provide retention for the mounting plaster. Note the mounting plates already in place on the articulator. The upper cast is then located on the transfer jig assembly and the incisal pin is then set to zero. The upper surface of the cast is moistened and whip mix snap stone is used to mount the cast on the articulator. It is important that the stone has not begun to set as the increased pressure will introduce distortion. When the stone is set, the transfer jig assembly is removed from the articulator and the incisal table is replaced. The pin is opened by one to two millimeters to allow for the thickness of the blue mousse. The articulator is inverted and the lower cast is located against the upper cast using the blue moves centric relation records. The lower cast is then mounted on the articulator in the same way as the upper cast and the stone is allowed to set. The articulator is then uprighted the blue mousse removed, the incisal pin is adjusted to zero 
and now retruded contact position can be checked on the articulator using GHM tape in a Miller's forceps. Here we can see that retruded contact position is clearly marked on upper left seven and lower left seven. The accuracy of our record can be confirmed in the patient's mouth using Shimstock. The slide from retruded contact position to intercuspid position can be clearly seen on the articulator. Once again, the accuracy of our record can be confirmed in the patient's mouth. During the construction of crowns and bridges which are involved in excursive movements of the mandible, it is much easier and far more accurate for our technicians to work with models mounted correctly on a semi-adjustable articulator. Does this mean then that we want to alter all our patient's occlusions into our concept of an optimal occlusion? No, of course not. There are many patients with all sorts of derangements of their occlusion, but who present with no symptoms with which we need to be concerned. However, it is our duty as restorative dentists to ensure that we do not contribute in any way to occlusal disharmony. It should be a routine to ensure that occlusions are left as stable as possible without offering extensive treatment solely to achieve this. And new occlusal interferences should not be introduced when restoring teeth. The occlusion of the teeth is the key to oral function. Surely it is the minimum expectation of the competent practitioner that he or she can diagnose and treat simple occlusal disharmonies and is able to produce restorations that will avoid the creation of iatrogenic occlusal disease. Um, I suppose um, cause it's, you can, it's easy to choose tougher things, isn't it? And it's like chewing tough the fun of eating, isn't it, I suppose? <laughs>